Okay, so finally, um, we've had all these impressions from the from the islands from Kos, from Samos, and most likely it's going to be similar with the other islands. Um, so the question to you that you are working more on European um, politics and have an overview. How do these camps fit into um, overall EU, EU migration policies? As a background, the camps were planned by a task force by the EU Commission after the fire in Moria in September 2020. And at the same time, uh, the Commission presented what is called the new pact on asylum and migration. That means some kind of an attempt to formulate an EU-wide migration policy agenda, like all the member states together. This pact has not uh, adopted yet, like since like two and a half years now, but still um, there is some kind of a link between like this uh, proposed pact and the this policy agenda formulated in this new pact. Um, Karl, could you give us a little bit of a hint about the yeah, the relationship between this new pact and the new closed camps on the islands. Thank you. Uh, uh, fingers crossed that you hear me. I'm uh, in my office in Frankfurt and hope, hopefully you can understand me. Yes. The combination or the question, how is Greece connected to the pact? Greece was first, the Greek hotspot approach was first, the uh, the old camps and the new camps are already existing and maybe the so-called pact, hundreds of papers, legal stuff for the basket because it's, it's, it's an approach to codify derogations from law and undermine rule of law and refugee rights. So the, the pact came later after Moria burned down and the, the, the key aspect, there are many aspects, and it's, uh, hopefully it will never find that there will be never a compromise between the Council and the European Parliament concerning this legal toxic stuff. What is very crucial in this pact, and there was also a political agreement, uh, uh, 10 of June in the Minister of Interior, um, council meeting um, that they want to, to implement a, a kind of screening regulation, starting with a screening regulation, which is not necessary to have an own regulation. It's, screening should be part of an asylum procedure. But this screening regulation proposal would create and codify detention for five days, up to 10 days, and then channel people in border procedures, like we heard from Kos and Samos, uh, and then maybe in deportation procedures. And let's say if you only read the paper, uh, which is not uh, at the moment law, then you would have a situation of screenings and then different gates to channel people, refugees, survivor of shipwrecks, uh, former victims of pushbacks in different in different um, procedures, high speed procedures, uh, like our colleagues mentioned, and uh, this means months of detention, whatever uh, control center, pre removal uh, detention centers, multifunctional put together. So, in a nutshell, EU already paid invested in, in a very awful new type of detention centers and closed or controlled refugee camps. And now the Commission offers uh, the, the, the hardliners in Europe uh, an approach to codify this kind of hotspot or now new camp approach as the future of the Euro so-called European asylum system. So what we face at the moment, it's not uh, something like a new area, like Mitarakis, the pushback minister of Greece, told. It's uh, more an end game in Europe concerning the right to seek asylum, concerning human, uh, human rights, concerning rule of law, 
and Greece, young dignity, Greece is the lab as Athena also mentioned, so the lab since many years. So we have to frame this whole discourse concerning new camps, old camps, in this context, in this context of denying refugee rights, denying access to asylum, access to the territory, and uh, yeah, to, to deny human dignity, to deny a dignified welcoming. So this is, the camps are one tool in this context, a very crucial tool, but as we all know, it's combined with a systematic pushbacks in the Aegean, systematic pushbacks, violation of international law, of the non refoulement principles at the land border. It's accompanied with, yeah, violent actions before people get access to the islands and the so-called controlled camps. So it's everything at stake. And if you talk about Greece, you could also talk about Medea or about Belarus, about the situation from Bulgaria to Turkey. Uh, we talk about the pact on asylum and migration at the same time. Uh, yeah, the majority of member states in the EU, and Greece is a frontline state, very crucial, uh, don't implement EU law, existing EU law, don't follow the Charter of the Fundamental Rights, and they violate the 1951 Convention and the Euro European Convention on Human Rights on a daily basis. So, yeah, but just uh, like, so to so, summarize that, that means that actually, as we already mentioned, the link, you would say, at the one hand side, the link is that these camps are like one part, like one aspect of this broader attempt to like diminish uh, the right to asylum. And we have this other aspect that actually on the islands there's already something happening which has not been yet decided on. So in this, in this pact there is this idea of having something like a screening that means actually something like this detention. You have people um, at the border not letting them like enter officially but detaining but detain them on the border. And the interesting thing is that even though there's no compromise yet on this pact, the EU is actually already financing yeah. this to it make it a reality. It's a strange combination when we, we heard the reports of Daphne and Athena uh, and we saw the pictures and the, the, the testimony. So we have a high tech very expensive, controlled, surveillance, intimidating uh, camp, with very modern, high-speed asylum procedures, whatever this is, without proper legal representation. Yeah, actually, and, to, to and some also, also without proper medical treatment, and also in the other hotspots or camps. Yeah, so a hell of money is spent, but not in human dignity, deterrence. I don't know what. So much money, and nothing really was delivered in favor of refugees and asylum seekers and vulnerable persons. So this is one the new world of the Commission. This high tech uh, camps. And on the other hand, we have still an ongoing and very effective, let's say this is the Greek miracle and the elephant in the room, ongoing uh, violence, violence up to torture, killings in the context of pushbacks, yeah, at the land border, people uh, dying in the snow near the, the Greek land border, without mobile, without proper uh, trousers and so on. So uh, an alleged pushback, but no investigation, nobody cares. So this is the other side. So the combination between this very violent, effective violation of international law, on the same hand, the proper EU style technocratic and with the same outcome that the refugees have not the rights to be sub 
subject in the asylum procedure, a fair asylum procedure in, under detention conditions with limited access or no access of legal representation or legal counseling is not a fair asylum procedure. And then again, in this procedure, now it's not working, Athena already mentioned this, they create the, the safe third country concept for additional countries like Afghanistan, Syria, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Somalia, as Turkey as a safe third country. The country which is totally unsafe for their own citizens is also totally unsafe for these refugees. And we know that uh, Afghan refugees could be deported quite easily from, from Turkey. It's only not working because Greece and Turkey is not working together and the COVID situation and so on stopped the deportation. But this is happening uh, in this wonderful new controlled center. Yeah, and maybe so, to uh, throw in a number there, you said it's a hell of money. It's actually 276 million euros, which um, the EU spends on these uh, new camps. I think that's yeah, a very interesting aspect if you think of how often the argument is like, ah, but it's too costly to accommodate people. It's yeah, yeah. it's like a very so, huge number and also like a huge number if you think that it's yeah. actually not yet official policy. So, I, this, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is, uh, we, uh, okay, first, in the first round, let's say if you start the last decade before the Turkey deal in 2016 was implemented by a, a press release of the European Council by Merkel and others. So it was just a deal. It was not based on law, it was not based on EU law. First step to, to, to totally, uh, yeah, colonize in this sense, Greece, the former government, to force the former government always to, to, to increase pressure and to, to create new laws, more restrictive law, uh, laws, sometimes written in Berlin. This was the first step, and with these miserable conditions, 160,000 passed these awful hotspots and suffered and were destroyed in this hotspot, and we had all the pictures, many pictures. But now, after the deal policy is still existing as a general approach, we have more the out of sight, out of mind approach, and I appreciate uh, the reports of the colleagues to make this present, to, to, uh, to understand what is happening in this machinery. It's not just a detention center or a control center. Inside is a machinery which, uh, with the deprivation of rights of refugees. And to understand what is inside, who is acting inside against refugee, against refugee rights is also very important, but it's not so easy to communicate. Therefore, the Greek islands, because of the numbers, but also because of the pictures, is not so present anymore in, in Europe. And unfortunately, these refugees, a part of the Greek colleagues who work inside and outside and try to help in different parts of Greece, also in camps on the mainland, or detention centers on the mainland, uh, these refugees are now forgotten. Yes, in the so new world of the EU and financed by our money for nothing, for nothing. It's just deterrence, nothing else. There is no impact concerning human dignity. Yeah, you mentioned it's financed by our money, so by European uh, money, where obviously German is um, yeah, like a big source of that money. Um, we were wondering, because we were talking about Greece so much, about the Greek government and about the EU, we were wondering what is the role of the German government exactly in developing these new camps on the island? Okay. Uh, the, Tur the famous Turkey deal was produced in, in Berlin, Den Haag, uh, Brussels, and then the Greek government, the former Greek government, was convinced, 
I don't know why, but it was you know, with friction in the government, but the series of government. Then we had this time of dominating all Greek laws by the EU and by Berlin. Sometimes Merkel made remarks concerning the new legislation, Merkel, the former chancellor of Germany. And everything was financed by the EU, but the outcome was only this horrible situation in Moria and other places, and a situation uh, that people get, yeah, more, more than 160,000, it's more. People were victims of this bloody toxic deal because they were forced to stay a long, long period under miserable conditions on the island. This was also, at this time, now it's different, a kind of verdict by Brussels and Berlin. So then, actually, it does play a very <laughs> crucial role also, like and with starting the, with this EU the new government and this, uh, the escalation of violence it was already mentioned in March, February, March two, uh, 2020. Uh, uh, the, it was crystal clear, uh, we all know the picture when von der Leyen and the all EU representatives went to Evros and all the, they saw all the tear gas and the, the, the violence, but they said, you are the shield of Europe and Mitarakis and his prime minister understood this very well. They Mitarakis is the migration minister of Greece. Migration, responsible for migration and the prime minister were quite, uh, they understood now we have carte blanche to do whatever we want. Suspension of the right to seek asylum and a pushback, whatever is possible. And uh, they created an, a new type of violent forms of pushbacks and they don't care anymore about uh, international documentation by UN organizations or Council of Europe, Human Rights Commission or whatever. I don't speak about the NGOs. <laughs> they say this is everything is fake news. Fake news. It's about Erdogan, but not we are clean. So this is a new situation. And in this situation, the former government, uh, the former minister of interior of Zeeuwe was first very happy with this very tough Greek government and the very tough approach to close this entrance. But then he had another problem. and. The current government has also this problem. It's not a real problem because of the deal is not functioning anymore. Turkey is closed concerning deportations back. Only pushbacks, illegal pushbacks are possible and these are, uh, these are executed. Uh, all the recognized refugees, or many of them, Germany more than 50,000, used the granted refugee status to travel further on to Germany and uh, seek asylum again. More than 50,000 people because they had no survival chance on the streets of Athens or elsewhere. The German courts also followed the expertise of our Greek colleagues, of our Greek partner organization, Refugee Support Chien, and stopped to Greece because bed, soap, and bread, uh, and bed, soap, and soap, and something else is not available. So the human dignity is not available. So it was long days. So the third, uh, I will memorize. This is, and then just to, to show this double moral standards and this hypocrite approach everywhere. They said, okay, we have a problem with Greece, and they sent a letter to the Commission. What about the implementation of EU law in Greece? The, Greece is violating this EU law, and therefore we have the secondary, so called secondary movement to Germany Act Commission. The Commission never acted concerning Greece and infringement procedures, hmm, sanctions, in a proper way. Greece is in a way protected. And German, the German approach was and is very hypocritical because they don't care about implementation of human dignity in other places, but only when the people go further on because they have no chance to survive, they realize there is an EU law which should be implemented. So, 
both sides play all sides play a very yeah double moral standard and they are more or less together when it's about deterrence and about common externalization of responsibility Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, putting it into perspective, we've seen that there's actually like a large role of Germany, which kind of brings me to the like last question to the round until we finally open the floor, which is like what to do now. <laughs> so we've heard a little bit what strategy um, these camps serve in kind of this framework of EU migration politics, but um, just very quickly starting um, with you, Atina, what would be your your wish or you like your idea um, in how to organize also like um, as organizations like borderline against this yeah this approach and this like laboratory in Greece becoming the reality at the external borders in general not an easy question to answer um, I would say multi-level strategy like bringing attention understanding um, as a lawyer, the, the, the legal requirements, the legal conditions, uh, the violations that take place, but I cannot give a straight answer. But events like this, again, bring attention to what is happening on the ground and understanding the politics behind it. Thank you. Um, also, you, Carl, uh, like very briefly, what would you say, like, <laughs> what to do? Uh, fight the deal at any cost. We don't want detention centers at the external border and we don't want to have border procedures, asylum procedures at the border. I think we have to fight for, to revitalize international law. We don't need a new pact. We need that EU stick to the key principles of international law. And then step by step we have to, yeah, defend the right to seek asylum human dignity, so let's say the core of Article 2 of the EU Treaty is about rule of law and everything is at stake. So it's, and we additionally fight for, uh, not in a screening regulation, we fight for a robust independent border monitoring mechanism to end the violence. It's very important that the perpetrators we bring to justice. It's, it's, it, we, the, the survivors of violence and torture at the EU borders and all the, the family members of the dead deserve our support. And just only one, one, one remark, a very crucial case in Greece was in 2014 in January, all over Europe it was discussed, uh, eight kids and three women from Afghanistan died in a pushback operation near Pharmaconisi. And the family members, they wait still seven and a half years for justice. And now Thursday is, is the judgment of the, uh, of the Strasbourg court. So fingers crossed that these family members who suffered so much because of the violence and the pushback operation get a little bit justice. And their approach was, it's not about us, it's about the next, the coming refugees, that they don't suffer this. So fingers crossed that we have a little bit of justice together with the family members. Thank Thursday. you very much. Uh, could you uh, switch off your YouTube? I think that's a bit of a problem with the live stream. Thank you very much. We had, yeah, it's, a, it's a very difficult question, I admit. What is the solution? But thanks for the hints you gave. Thank you for your uh, patience. Sorry, it got a bit long with the technical stuff. Still, I hope uh, you're inspired to have some questions to the, the podium. I think um, somebody from us will go around with a microphone and you can just like put up your hand and ask them. Any questions? <laughs> Is everyone tired? I don't know whether there's something from, from the people online or they are already, we lost them. <laughs> yes. Okay, obviously there's no one with a microphone. Uh, yeah, for, for online. Um, yeah, thank you, first of all, um, for all these 
words and for all your informations and also thank you Waterline Europe to give the chance for the people to speak um, about their expertise and what they know. Um, I have actually a thousand questions, but my biggest question is always, you mentioned it so often, it's not legal, we have um, this and that law internationally, European laws, all this stuff. Was there ever any court case that either, I know, I know there, there have been some court cases because of the pushbacks, I think, but is there any court case according to the COS pre-removal detention center? Would you mind to say something about it? We won't say it at all. Um, so we challenge this unlawful detention in Greek courts, especially in the context of being detained with a view to deportation when the Greek-Turkish borders are closed since March 2020, which means that the detention is de facto illegal. And we went to the court and we were, I think, the first to challenge such uh, this type of detention for cause. And I think we have won the majority of them. And we have um, drafted, we have created them again a multi-level strategy to address this. And one of, one of uh, the approach that we are going for is the courts, but there are also other ways that we um, bring attention to this detention issue and we actually manage to release people. So yes, Greek courts have said that this detention is illegal, but you have to remember that this is only um, decided on an individual uh, basis, which means that we cannot go for the entirety of the detainees being detained in the pre-removal detention center, we have to pick specific, we have to represent uh, every person um, at once. So this is a matter of capacity, this is a matter of how many lawyers you have, how many cases you can take over. Um, but yes, short answer, Greek courts have found such detention illegal and we have uh, drafted um, a bigger strategy which has also resulted in a shift um, in the detention policy on the island and has ultimately resulted in more people being released from detention. So that means to think positively um, regarding to this, what you did already, it might be hopefully change that the pre-removal detention centers are not allowed anymore. I think this would be a very optimistic way to see the situation because I think we are uh, winning small battles, like um, local even, because we see that what we are doing or what we are experiencing on coast is not the same uh, in different islands, uh, not only detention but other policies as well. So it is all about the local uh, jurisdiction, the local way of implementing law, which is crazy if you think about it, that in different islands, the law is being implemented in a different way, but this is the reality in Greece. Um, so I cannot say that these small wins will ultimately lead to the European Union suddenly deciding that pre-removal detention centers are uh, entirely illegal, um, but I don't know how else we can fight, as lawyers at least, if not uh, by these means. Thanks a lot. I would have another question if that's okay. Um, you were talking about Kos and Samos. Um, do you have any information about all the other islands, Lesbos, Chios and Leros, as far as I know? We have an office on Chios and the situation is a bit different there because the new closed uh, center, closed control access center um, is not like they cannot even decide uh, where and how to start building it. There is a resistance from the people on the island. So we are talking about the old structure still and there is no detention. So again, you, you see a completely different situation. The arrivals have decreased during the past months because of the pushbacks. Um, the situation is generally better than before, but still uh, problematic.
Uh, yeah. <clears throat> well, thanks for all of the discussion we had. Recording so far. in progress. Yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> um, yeah, I have two questions actually. The first one is quite practical and low scale, kind of. So, because so you say you were saying that in those detention camps, under certain um, circumstances, people are even kept from, yeah, like leaving the camp, moving around the island, which is hard enough in itself, but sometimes they're not even allowed to exit. On what reasons would that happen? Like, is that, yeah. Not to exit at all. Or on Yeah, not to exit and like, just to be stuck in the camp. Even if they don't have like a, a pushback status or something, they are there. So this is, I can respond for cause. Uh, so this is um, the different types of detention that I was talking about. So if you are properly detained in the pre-removal detention center, uh, you are not allowed to exit at all. You are there detained prison. If you are in the open uh, center, which is part of the closed controlled access facility nowadays, uh, you are only allowed to leave for specific uh, periods of time um, and your, your movement is generally restricted and this is provided for by the law. I don't know if mm -hmm. this answers your question somehow. Yeah, I guess kind of. And yeah. um, on Samos, the, what we saw the camp on Samos, the big one with for 3,000 people, this is including the pre-detention, the pre-removal center. Yeah. So within this camp, within the, the NATO type fencing, within the barbed wire, the whole structure, there is another area a bit f like uh, to the side of the camp, which is called the pre-removal. And there are several containers with beds and toilets and cameras inside the corridors. Uh, for for the people who will be rejected and ultimately deported when this happens. But because now they're not deported because of uh, the EU-Turkey agreement or people uh, being deported to Turkey, Turkey is not accepting since uh, March 2020 now, they those that are rejected, they can remain in the camp. So they don't, it's not operational, the pre-detention so far. They are still in the camp, but they cannot actually leave the premises unless it's like a very serious medical reason. Um, if they're rejected, rejected or double rejected, they have to, they can walk within the camp and, and play volleyball or uh, just move into the camp. They're not in the actual prison section of the camp, yeah. but they can't leave the, the facilities because in theory, they are rejected and they are now illegal with a stamp. You know, they're not uh, allowed to have any access to, to any services or uh, outside the camp or, you know, leave because in, in fear that they might escape or... Yeah, that also so. takes me to my second question because if I got it right, that's basically all that Greece is doing right now. All that they do is um, the common practice is actually right into that rejection uh, process, right? Well, so which, yeah, which Turkey doesn't cooperate with. Yes, more, more or less, like because now, I mean, because Greece has deemed Turkey a safe third country for five nationalities uh, that will be rejected. If they're rejected in Greece, Turkey has to take them back because they came from Turkey. Yeah. But now Turkey is not taking them back. So these people are stuck in limbo yeah. because they can't go back or forward or anywhere yeah. and uh, yes yeah, so they're they're receiving quite a few rejections i would say or then they will have to reapply again it's uh, for for the second uh, asylum application as a, as i mentioned before yeah. so the first rejection and then apply again um, and then again if they're sometimes rejected twice sometimes they can leave i mean there are some loopholes in the system you see people that are rejected that have come to the mainland and tr try to find other ways smugglers to move forward to forward in you know central or northern europe uh, across the balkan route or other ways or you know this they try with different ways yeah. to to leave if they manage to <laughs> and also do you have any do you dare to make any prognosis on when Turkey might at least like cooperate in that process. Not that it's the one to wish for. Actually, maybe we shouldn't even 
discussed it, but like otherwise well, people are just in that state of limbo, right? And they yes, exactly, because yeah. that's it's since March 2020, and now we have uh, it's July 2022, and they have not cooperated since. Now the situation is a bit quite fragile between Greece and Turkey. There's tensions uh, between both countries. There's elections in Turkey next uh, year, and actually, yeah, in June or anyway, in under a year, maybe or next year. So it's it's a bit challenging now. I don't know how Turkey will react with that because, of course, pre-election times, uh, Erdogan wants to put out a specific narrative as well for for his, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you. To Briefly add to that answer, I think the situation is um, ridiculous in Greece because Turkey has uh, said in every possible way that they are not applying the EU-Turkey um, statement anymore, like that they have suspended it officially. And even after these kinds of statements, Greece continued to um, create the policy on asylum based on its core principle that Turkey is a safe third country at the beginning for Syrians and then for even more nationalities. And this was done uh, with the view of what you said, like to, to lead to even more rejections and to being able ultimately to deport, to readmit more people to, to Turkey. And they have built this whole system around Turkey when Turkey has uh, literally said that, no, I'm not cooperating with you anymore. No, I'm not taking any, any, anybody back. And um, I think it is very difficult for the Greek government and the European policy in general to backtrack from building its entire uh, asylum agenda on Turkey being a safe third country and actually trying to apply this to many more uh, countries outside of Europe. Uh, so, and it is a very ridiculous situation. That is a problem that is impacting like thousands of people right now in Greece, leading to rejections and prolonged detention. Right. Any more questions? <laughs> if not, um, it's already. I mean, others. Hi, uh, I have a question, maybe more uh, to you, Daphne, as a journalist. Um, coverage and reportage from Greece reaching Germany, at least in our circle of people, are rightfully so directed to to the German government, or Angela Merkel, as Karl said it as the architects of the deal and responsible for the suffering of so many people in the Greek islands and the peripheries. But I wonder how would you say does your work as a journalist in Greece impact uh, the atmosphere in Greek civil society? I mean, we have seen in the past months and even years that uh, it's become very hostile towards journalists under the neo uh, government. So I wonder you know, you have to be very fierce in your work and probably think about this many times. How do you see your work going into the camps or, you know, trying to enter and bringing pictures to the public? What do you, th what do you see happening? Thank you. Well, um, yes, it is a good question. Um, but now the thing is that I'm thinking mostly that the narrative has changed in Europe. And it has changed in Greece from becoming, you know, a welcoming. I mean, at the whole of Europe, basically, refugees welcome then has become into no more uh, camps, no more uh, refugees, no more uh, people are here because uh, we've had enough. Greece, you know, Lesbos, Chios, Samos, all the islands, we've had, the, they've had the, to share, you know, they've had the burden of all these years in 2015, 16, 17. And and then the narrative changed a lot with Moria, with Chios, with Samos. The, we had these uh, issues where journalists were trying to to go and work uh, as journalists and report on the stories. But the local society, the local people, and the Greek um, 
the Greek people were saying that you are always listening to the refugees and the asylum seekers and you're not listening to the locals, then, for, you know, I would say myself, okay, well, talk to us, tell us what your concerns are. And, w well, we did manage to do that sometimes, but then in the year you just saw that they were, no, no, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about this. I don't want any visibility of the refugee situation uh, because it's just um, advertising, uh, advertising uh, in favor of the refugees and the NGOs and, and uh, not in favor of the local people and the tourists, which for example, the islands want you know to have so it's like we are having a bad image on our islands and th that was the most difficult thing for me not actually accessing so much the camps or talking to people in the camps or getting some information it was struggling uh, struggling to do that of course but it's always challenging you know because i mean you know you have to f uh, for many reasons logistical and whatever and um, uh, reasons and getting the information correct when there's many people, partners, so, you know, civil society organizations involved, government ministries. It's it's you know it's a process. But the hardest part for me was like actually, you know, the locals and how they reacted. You know, when you tried to to speak to them on where you are there to cover. Oh, you're again here to do th something about the refugees and. As if, you know, as if now you're advertising this and this is why more refugees will be coming and NGOs are bringing more refugees here on the islands because they need them to have work. So this trying to combat this narrative is, is you know, it's difficult. That's m what's actually more tiring I in a way. And, and lately I'm trying to also minimize how much I write about it or actually report about it uh, filtering because I don't want it to be have the the opposite effect you know like too much uh, talking about this or uh, having this stigma then that you are the refugee reporter you're a pro that and then everyone against you know this polarization that exists in in society whereas you just try to speak to people and see how you can and see why why they they think this way or what are their concerns and are they valid because many times they have like false information like they think refugees take 300 euros per month no that's not true you tell me that is not true they take 75 euros that's and it's not money from directly from you it's european money that we uh they are entitled you know they're seeking asylum and they're no no they're taking 300 and everything is paid and they live for free which you know it's not true so that's very hard to combat this kind of pre-existing preconceptions i don't know narrative that people have uh, around you um, and it's like sometimes you think you're doing stories or reports that will actually reach more people who are like-minded and not the other people that you also want them you want your your uh, whatever reports to reach Was there another hand? First of all, I want to say thank you for your work and also for this um, event tonight. My question, um, maybe it's difficult, <laughs> but for me, I feel a really huge frustration. And as you already said, the um, international legal documents lost their power in a way or really reached their limits and my question is what do you think could fill this gap what could really um, create a way of accountability um, what yeah what do you think what could be an option when these international human rights documents lost their power it is directed to me, eh? It's for you all, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, I think they um, intention, uh, intentionally lost their power somehow. I think they were devalued by um, the di different actors like playing this game. And I think as a lawyer, I th I think they are enough somehow to protect their rights. I think there is enough legislation in place uh, to provide for like 
a dignified asylum procedure in general uh, without these atrocities that we are witnessing every day. So as a lawyer, what I do and I think what I would others want to do um, is to go back to these legal instruments and actually trying to enforce them um, in every way possible and in every level uh, possible. So it is not always also remember about strategic litigation. I think this has become very like hip and modern, but it's, you can go, you can go to national courts, you can do the smallest things uh, that are actually bringing the attention back to the law and say, okay, I'm not crazy, this is illegal, it is written in the law that is, it is illegal, um, you have to stop this violation. So um, I think, and I was also discussing yesterday about account accountability and it is not easy to, to seek accountability and to, to, to see all of these people actually going to court at some point and like being charged for the, um, um, there are different crimes in many, so many different levels, but as lawyers, uh, why not try to do this? Like, why tr not try to build cases like that and collect the data and the information and the evidence to eventually go to court? So um, it is not a very clear road and it is not a very clear strategy, but I think if you go back to the law and you read the law, then you somehow get inspired and you remember how the situation should be like instead of what it is like and then you can actually find the remedies and the legal ways to challenge this. Maybe one last question if there is one, if not. No, and I would like to say here that, um, for example, many times I'm talking to refugees, asylum seekers, and they're saying, how, uh, how are you going to help us, you know, well, I talk to you or whatever, and then what is this going to benefit me? Maybe I get a rejection, maybe I'm uh, per persecuted by someone here, I don't know, you know, whatever. And I'm saying, look, I cannot help you. I mean, this meaning speaking to you and getting your story and listening uh, to what you have to tell me and building a report will not directly help you because you know I'm just tr trying to report to raise awareness um, but it's not going to change your situation but here this is the only person who are actually the only uh, the uh, the only ones that can actually affect really affect people's life are, are lawyers and legal organizations and uh, working with refugees and for refugees because it's not we don't know it, we don't see it, but they, they see it. They, you can actually have an impact and uh, uh, make a positive change with small, small steps. But I, I also think that everybody can help, like from their own profession and with their own attitude. And um, we do not operate in, operate in a closed system. So it's not always only lawyers required to bring this these situations to justice, there are much more, like many more professionals that are needed to do this. Uh, so journalists for fact finding and monitoring and reporting Definitely. and like ev everybody basically. And we just like um, deal with the evidence and we present them to a court. So everybody I would say. Yeah, and I would strongly say also non-professional activists, and this is a good <laughs> moment to say, if you feel um, very frustrated um, now, and of course I cannot offer you a solution, but this is like a very warm invitation to join like also political groups and organ organizations, demonstrations, and you're very welcome also uh, to join us, Borderline Europe. Um, like we will be around and we can like chat about how to get active. But in general, I would say um, there's always like whatever background you have, there's always an opportunity to help like create the pressure and create the attention we need in order for this to be stopped at some point. And yeah, like I remember when I started getting politically active that I was always very timid because I thought like, ah, I don't, I don't really know how to organize a demonstration. I don't know how to do things, but really like 
this is what activism is about. Like you just you just get started and like work together as a, as a group, and like we would be very happy if, if you come up to us or email us afterwards and help out. And also, yeah, maybe if you have if you happen to have spare money, leave a donation and have uh, drinks with us after the event. Yeah. Uh, and also, maybe as a last call, and those of you who haven't registered yet, that would be really cool if you just could, could sign for the people who are funding this. So, with this uh, call, unless there's something still urgently to be said from you, no, I would say thank you very, very much also to you, Carl, and to this very interesting input. Also, thank you very much for the technical support. I think we, we had a lot of demands to you. Thank you very much and to everyone involved. Thank you.